let's touch on like how many years have you worked in this field and what have you seen in terms of like the housing crisis as a whole in Halifax um, and how that's kind of progressed and how that's changed, especially over the last, you know, three or four years, especially where it's really been, you know, a lot more prevalent, I guess, within uh, the news. Yeah. I started doing this work back in 2010, 2011. Um, and back then it was a lot, as we all know, you know, 13, 14 years ago, it was a lot easier to find apartments. Housing was a lot cheaper. And even when I started doing housing work back then, it was you could usually find an apartment for somebody. It wouldn't be maybe the ideal location or the ideal size or maybe not the nicest building, but at least you could find an apartment and at least landlords were willing to kind of give people a, sh uh, a shot, give people a chance at, at um, their own place to live. And sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't, but you could always, you know, there's usually a spot in farther out in the suburbs or something like that we could find a spot for. But now all those places, there was just a story in the news recently about how Spryfield has lost a lot of its like affordable housing um, through the private market and in every city, every neighborhood's the same way, you know, Fairview's the same way. I used to know half the people in Fairview and now it seems like I go to Fairview and I don't know anybody there because it's all um, moderately priced, I guess, rich, maybe a little bit above averagely priced apartments where it used to be, used to be $600, $700 apartments all over the place in Fairview. Um, and same thing, Dartmouth North, same thing with a lot of different neighborhoods. There's just no um, affordable housing in any of these neighborhoods anymore, it seems. So that's the biggest change that I've seen is is just that lack of any kind of private market affordable housing. And, and you know, the, they've been bought up by a lot of different landlords and, you know, people have been renovated. And in some cases, it's like great because a lot of the places that these landlords have been um, buying up and, and kicking people out of, they were not very great apartments to begin with. But it's also there's people that live there. And it's nice to see them improving buildings, I guess, but not at the expense of somebody's place to live. And so that's why... Ultimately, I think we see such an increase in homelessness is because as these apartments get more and more expensive and landlords get a little bit more picky about who they're going to take because they have, you know, 50 people applying for one unit, that it just means the people on the lowest end of that income scale, the people who are on income assistance or people who are working very, like, low-wage jobs can't afford it. And so they just end up on, on the streets. And we talked about that the other day of just, like, yeah, 10, 15 years ago, the people who were living outside and the people who were homeless for a long time were usually people that not only could they, you know, not afford an apartment or not have a job or anything like that. They also really struggled with their, their mental health or they really struggled with their physical health or they had some kind of drug addiction or, or alcohol addiction or something like that. And now we still have that many people and there's probably more folks like that, but we also have this whole new cohort of people who are simply priced out of the market. There was people I've worked with that have worked, you know, all summer long, they're doing landscaping, they're making 20 odd dollars an hour and they just go home from work and they just go to sleep in a tent and then they get up at 4am the next day and do it all over again all summer long. And it's just like, you guys are doing everything right. Like I don't, I don't have any experience working with people like you who are just like really just like, you know, my dad or something like that. And it's just like, I don't know how to make affordable apartments. You don't need any support. Like I just give you a $1,000 a month apartment. You could afford it and you'd be fine, but those apartments don't exist anymore. Um, and so it's a really tricky part of the problem now is just the numbers are so big of just people that don't have a lot of other things going on. They just really can't afford it. And I don't know what the solution for that is other than just building more and more low income apartments because the private market is not going to be able to provide enough for those folks. Yeah, I think like a really common misconception, I think, from the general public about homelessness and the housing crisis situation is, you know, well, why don't they just get a job or like, why don't they just stop doing drugs or whatever that might be? And, you know, sure, there's some people that are going to have mental illness issues, you know, or, you know, struggle with mental illness. They're going to have um, drug addiction or whatever it may be. But like you said, a lot of the people now that are, you know, living rough or, you know, facing homelessness or we're on the brink of that are working individuals. They work jobs. They work, you know, 40 hours a week. They have a car. They, you know, get to work and back. They're responsible. They're reliable. You know, a lot of them that I've seen in the news and on social media and stuff, too, that are having issues finding places, it's not like their budget's $800 a month. Like some of them, their budgets are like 1500 or 1600 and they still can't find a place to live. And it's interesting because my father, for example, owns like an almost 60 unit building down in Bridgewater and half of his building is on income assistance um, with the town of Bridgewater. And every time a unit comes up, we're talking 50 applications like right away. Um, you know, so that's a huge part of the problem is this new world of 
affordability is not so affordable, right? Like now an apartment at $1,600 a month would be considered affordable. Well, I bought my first home about six or seven years ago. I never once paid over like $1,100 for rent. And I lived in pretty nice spots that would now be, you know, rented for like $2,300 or $2,400. So, you know, a big question I think a lot of people have is, you know, what do you see coming? Do you think this is going to get better anytime in the, you know, somewhat near future? Um, and do you have any ideas of, you know, some initiatives that could be taken either by, um, you know, private lending or government kind of lending as well to, you know, push this further in the right direction and to try to, you know, get us out of what we're in right now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a bunch of things there to talk about. The one thing that we, we always kind of talk about in, in, in my work is, is the definition of affordable. And I think CMHC defines affordable as 80% of the average market rent for that area, which, yeah, could be if everything is $2,400, then affordable is $2,100, which is, I guess, cheaper than $2,400, but still not affordable for me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I couldn't afford that. Um, and so I like to think of affordable in terms of like rent geared to income and how much people are making. And I think the main one for that is is like public housing. So public housing is, is just 30% of your income and anything like that that is funded totally by the government because uh, a lot of people, a lot of I know people who know these things, economists and stuff, say you shouldn't be spending more than 30% or one-third of your income on housing. And so that's why we have those rent-geared income um, units for folks because that is really the only way you can actually, you know, afford housing and be able to pay for everything else if you're anywhere near, like, the low-income end of the spectrum. So, um, yeah, being mindful of what we define as affordable is the first thing. And then, um, yeah, I think I, I, I'm a big proponent of the government building as much um, – affordable or even like both definitions of affordable housing is possible because people who are working still can't afford $2,400 a month people. Um, so we do need as much incentives to build, um, anything like that as we can, because if not, I just see it as, you know, like look at Fairview or, or Spryfield now where it's the working, working professionals sometimes even not making, you know, not making minimum wage, making much more than minimum wage are just competing with people who are making minimum wage and people on income assistance. And so that doesn't help, anybody when you're when you're having those competitions because most of the time it'll go to the people making more money because the landlords will see those as a more um as a tenant who's more likely to pay the rent on time and i guess the 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 part of your question about what do we do is yeah just goes back to building as much as possible i think the province announced 220 odd units of of public housing that they're going to build which is great because it is the first time they've done that since i think the 90s um and i'm glad that they're they're doing that we just need that every you know every year or so because if not we're gonna have to open up a new bridge shelter every year with 190 uh beds for people who are experiencing homelessness because um the problem is just getting worse and worse as we see the price of housing getting worse and worse or getting more and more um if we don't do something about building more housing for folks i think it's just going to get worse before it gets any better and you know i i really like my job but it's really expensive to run a homeless shelter and i can't help but think of the millions of dollars that they're spending on on renting a, a a big hotel and paying all the staff who you know do great work and deserve every cent that they get for pay, it's just it's much cheaper and lots of studies have shown it's much cheaper to just give people apartments and, and put them in apartments and then put supports in them, uh, like wraparound supports around them after they get into housing rather than just providing these band aid shelters and transitional housing and stuff that's going to be around for a couple of years because you know those things a, it's just rent you're not going to be we're not going to have that housing forever. And five years from now, when somebody else buys the building or we have to move out, it's, we're not in any kind of, it's not like a long-term sustainable solution. So I, I think the, the key there is we just need to build housing or for every, I'd, I'd love to see for every dollar we spend on a band-aid solution, like um, homeless shelters and temporary and evicting people from encampments and parks and stuff like that. We should also put a dollar towards like, you know, some big pot that buys affordable housing because Right now, we're not building nearly enough affordable housing for the amount of people who are not only like visibly homeless and people that are in shelters and people in parks, but also the people that we don't know that are you know living in, staying on somebody's couch or crashing three people to a room because they can't afford to to move in on their own. And those are the people we don't have any idea of who they are, or how many people they are. But I bet you the number of people who are invisibly homeless is is many, many more times, is multiple times the amount of people that are you know the, the known homeless people. You know, there's probably I think the Affordable Housing Association 
It says there's around 1,100 people or so experiencing homelessness right now in Halifax, but I bet you the true number of that, if you include people that are couch surfing, it's, it's thousands and thousands of people that need, need housing just as much. So we just need to build lots. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with that. So I, I'm pretty sure it was the first time since 1993, so it would have been like 30 years that when they announced it, uh, I think it was late last year, they announced it, 222 new units. That's across the province, not just HRM too, right? So, you know, I think what you said is likely very accurate. Like, you know, okay, so if, if there's, you know, visibly a thousand homeless people, give or take an HRM, let's just call it that for the sake of this conversation. You know, like you said, how many more are couch surfing and things like that, which you could put it under that same category, basically. And then on top of that, I think a really scary number to know, and I, to be honest, I don't even know if I'd want to know it would be how many people are teetering right on that edge and, and, you know, barely making their payments and barely staying afloat in their place that they're living now. Um, and maybe they're, you know, in an apartment that's on the rent cap. And if they get evicted, then they're basically screwed for all intents and purposes. Right. Yeah. So I'm.